The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. We ask that God, the Holy Spirit, will take the things that we note and make them a challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Psalm 119.45 says, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts, your doctrine, and the word precepts indicates categorical doctrine, and not only that, principles, and 99.9% .9 of believers in this country would be hard-pressed to give me one principle related to the unique spiritual life. A lot of believers would be hard-pressed to give me the correct salvation message. They want to invite Christ everywhere to their barbecues, etc. But, uh, and you say, oh, that sounds blasphemous. Well, that's because of the way you've been taught, the way you've been raised. But nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to invite Christ into your heart. And heart, by the way, is stream of consciousness. In the Bible, it just doesn't say it. It's not there. And for many reasons, the heart is wicked and des is desperately wicked. Above all things, who can know it? That's a rhetorical question. Those of us who grow in grace and in knowledge can know it. The depravity of man, etc. See, I've already given you several principles of doctrine one of which is so, so basic that it has to do with salvation. Jeremiah 34, 17 states, Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So now I proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague, and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. This is Jeremiah teaching a nation that's about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline and <clears throat> they were going through some well they basically have the same makeup we do in terms of a culture of freedom. And they always talked about freedom. And so God is telling them, oh yeah, you hear all your politicians, they would be the priest of the day, talk about freedom. And they use the language. But you have not proclaimed my freedom is what he's saying. And his freedom refers to the laws of divine establishment. And the laws of divine establishment are extremely important. And the only way a client nation can exist is if they abide by the laws of divine establishment. And that's for believer and unbeliever alike. There are some countries in this world that are almost 99% unbeliever, but they follow the laws of divine establishment and have now become more prosperous than the United States. And uh, that's because we're under punishment. No country should be more prosperous than we are. Uh, the name of this country slips my mind at the moment, but it's uh, where they uh, cane whipped that boy a long time ago. You see, he was going out graffitiing and destroying property. And so, and he was an American. 
This was back during the 1990s. So they just took him out and sentenced him to a caning. And that's what he deserved because he didn't get his butt whipped as a child. He was a spoiled American messing up their country. And they wanted to protect their freedom and the things they own and built. And so that, that country in itself, even though I wouldn't want to live there, it's not a client nation, but they have freedom because they follow the laws of divine establishment. A client nation is different. It's set apart. But we still have to follow the laws of divine establishment, such as Thou shalt not steal. Now that's for believer and unbeliever. Why? Well, if you have everyone stealing everyone's property, you have a system in which uh, everyone loses motivation and everyone falls into poverty. So for our protection and our benefit and for us to be free to own property, without having it taken away randomly we have laws against theft but then there's the federal government and it's not the first time our federal government has or especially the executive branch has gotten too big and has pushed its weight around in fact if you were living during Roosevelt's day, you you would have had a hard time waking up and you'd be saying the same things. I can't believe this is my country, especially if you were a, a an achiever. You would say, I can't believe this is my country anymore. Roosevelt raised the confiscatory tax rate on the wealthy, their income tax rate, to 90%. The confiscatory tax rate on the wealthy now was just raised from 36 to about 40 percent. And that's today. So it was much higher back then, but uh, of course, with their ingenuity, they found loopholes. And uh, they find loopholes, the rich find loopholes now as well. Anybody with having that type of genius a genius toward money, not necessarily a genius toward anything else, but a genius toward capital and what to do with it. They find a way to keep it and grow it. It just seems that some people know how to touch something and make it start growing money. I seem to touch something and it wilts along with the money. It just flies out the window fly free money but freedom is what the Lord is talking about here and he very sarcastically says alright you're not going to follow my freedom then I'm going to give you these kinds of freedoms you're going to fall under the fifth cycle of discipline you're going to fall under the fourth the third and fourth cycle of discipline plague that is a a disease, massive disease, breakout, and famine. And I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When you are, are living the spiritual life, filled with God the Holy Spirit that's your freedom and it's a higher freedom than we could ever have in any country and if we were to lose our freedom in this country you know as Benjamin Franklin said this he said my country is the country where I can be free. In other words, he would just up and move to wherever there was freedom. But when it comes to the spiritual life, it was easy, sounded easy enough for him. But when it comes to the spiritual life, 
You can live under any system of government, evil, cruel, vicious, and you can make it in the spiritual life and have your freedom because they haven't yet been able to look into our soul and detect our spiritual life. And you need to remember that. Because you can't look into someone else's soul and detect theirs. You, oh, but by, by their fruits you will know them. By their fruits you will know them. By what fruit? Fruit cakes? What does it even mean? By their fruit. No, oh, that means their production. It's talking about spiritual fruit. Have you ever seen a spirit? If you have, go see a psychiatrist. Or lay off the alcohol. It is spiritual fruit. And it says, but it says you'll know them. That's only for the mature believers who know each other, who are grace-oriented toward each other. And they already know that by their constant dil diligence in learning the Word of God and by seeing the application of impersonal love, that's the greatest indicator. But remember, Galatians 5, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, speaking of impersonal love. Peace, speaking of tranquility of soul. And it says it's given to you by God the Holy Spirit. It's nothing we even do ourselves. Now we lear learn the doctrine, but without God the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be able to learn the doctrine. The only thing we do is either switch the light on, positive, or switch the light off, negative. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, the light's off. If you're filled with the Spirit and you're not able to concentrate on the Word, check yourself again and make sure you're filled with the Spirit. Your light should be on. Now, a baby believer might have a little bit of a dimmer light, but the light's on. Galatians 2, 4. This matter arose because some false believers, what it means by that, doesn't mean they were not believers. That's really not a good translation. Uh, many of them were believers and they were coming up from the Jerusalem church. They were the pilgrim type. Uh, if you were to associate them with uh, people today, you would call them uh, Wesleyans or those who do not follow the orthodox theology. They think they're doing something. And these were the type of people. They were believers. I'm sure some of them were unbelievers. But their doctrine was false. Is what it means. This matter arose because some doctrinally wrong believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom of we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. If you're still following the Mosaic law in part, nobody follows it in whole today, <laughs> which is funny uh, because it's hypocritical. But, if, but most people think of the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, and if I follow the Ten Commandments, 
then I'm good. I, that's the, they call it, they might even say they're spiritual. They might even go so crazy as to say they don't sin anymore. And that makes them a liar, as per 1 John 1 8. And they're trying to make God out to be a liar, as per 1 John 1 10. We still sin as believers. In fact, in 1 John, it says we continue to sin. And in Romans, the Apostle Paul begins ranting as if he's insane, as if he's two people. And he does so on purpose because he's a super genius, excellent communicator. He said, sometimes I do what I want to do, and then I do what I do not want to do. But I wanted to do it, but I did not want to do it, but I did it, and I keep doing what I do not want to do. Then I do it. And then I should be doing what I want to do and I do it. And you, you know that verse. I didn't quote it exactly. But if you read it, it sound, you would say, what a lunatic. <laughs> What's he talking about? He's talking about the battle between the old sin nature and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Very basic doctrine that people seem to forget so quickly. And many people never learned it. And that's a real shame. But they don't want to learn it. And they don't have freedom. In fact, what they want to do is spy on our freedom. Our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ to make us slaves. The easiest way to make somebody a slave is to intrude on what they are doing in their own lives, in other words, violate their privacy, and to tell them this is right and this is wrong and you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And um, I don't get out much here, so I rarely have that problem. But uh, when I have been out uh, and about here, I have never really heard someone tell me I shouldn't do this and I shouldn't do that. In fact, they were telling me you should do this and you should do that. But down south, uh, I was recently down there for my grandmother's funeral. Totally different situation. And the, the decorum of the people in the south because of their heritage is very polite and uh, they have manners kind of, uh, but they can also be extraordinarily rude and not know it, and extraordinarily hot-headed too, especially when you call them on their rudeness. I was doing something down there that some man did not like. He told me I should stop doing it. Well. We got into a discussion, and then the, at the end of it, he said, well, I asked him a question. He said, well, you got me on that one. But I just think he was ready to go. I have a tendency to do that to people. They're just ready to go because they've just ran into somebody who's going to tell them, stay out of my freedom in Christ. And furthermore, you know, you're preaching at me. Let me preach to you. That, that, that's my job. <laughs> but I'm a preacher too. Well, I'm a better one. Let's get into it. No, they don't, want, they don't even want to play Bible trivia anymore. So they want to intrude on your freedom. Take it away. And this is worse because it's, we're talking about in the spiritual realm. Now in Galatians 5.1 it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Why were we saved, in other words? First of all, we have to, let's just analyze it right here in the English. It is... Uh, 
it might be something awkward for us to hear. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And you might say, that sounds redundant. Well, you're going to have to separate it out. First, you're going to have to look at the, the fact that Christ has set us free. When did that occur? When, in, when each of us believed in Jesus Christ, we were set free. And for what purpose? To live a life of freedom. To after salvation, what? It is for freedom. Freedom of what? Your volition. And the freedom that comes from Bible doctrine is actually what it's referring to. The freedom related to the spiritual life. That freedom, the freedom to live your own spiritual life. That's why 1 Peter 3, 5 and 3, 9. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 2, 9. Uh, somebody look up 1 Peter 3, 5 for me while I keep going. It is, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's beside her. Maybe that is hers. What happened to your technology wizard? Look it up real quick. You mean playing games? <laughs> I'm playing. Don't change. He's got it. What, First Peter 3? First Peter? First Peter 2.5. There it is. And First Peter two nine. But you are chosen generation, royal prince, and a holy nation, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous So First Peter two five and two nine describe to us something that is phenomenal. You are a priest. I am priest, and you are a priest. I've been asked before, well, I want to show somebody these about privacy. Can you show me in the Bible all the things that talk about respecting one's privacy? Well, it's not like you can do a search and type in the word privacy and find it anywhere in the Bible. I haven't tried it, but I don't even think the word exists in the Bible. Privacy as it is. But it is indicated in a doctrine. You're a priest. What does a priest do? He represents himself before God. In the Old Testament, the priesthood went down through family lineage. And it didn't matter if you were a believer or unbeliever. You were a priest dependent upon genetics. That's an inferior priesthood, by the way. But they were to be the ones who would represent the children of Israel before God. But you're a priest, and he represented himself before God, but you're a priest. That means you represent yourself before God. And that shows how far off Roman Catholicism is. 
Now, how important is that? It's uh, almost uh, hard for me to describe. It's almost indescribable. But it has to do with the royal family honor code right there in 1 Peter 2.5 and 2.9. It means you're a priest. You represent yourself before God. Your spiritual life is between you and God and no one else. And there are too many believers. And I've even seen because of the fact that people have fallen away, that they call themselves doctrinal, and they have about as much doctrine, maybe just a tad more than, a few, than most. Instead of a thimble full, maybe they have a, a, a shot glass full. And that's about it. And uh, some people are so hard-headed in some areas, they make it their business to try to run everyone else's life. And that is not your job. As a priest, you represent yourself before God. You don't represent anyone else. And besides, when you go up to another priest who represents himself before God and you're trying to tell that other priest what to do, you are in total violation of the royal family honor code and it's evil. It's wrongdoing because you are violating spiritual freedom And that's why such people are called antichrists. They turn people away from the word. And they turn unbelievers away from even wanting anything to do with Christianity. But that's by their own volition. But they'll use it as an excuse always. Oh, I, I'll know. I'll never become a Christian. Why not? Those are the biggest hypocrites and backstabbers, and they run around and talk about each other behind their back. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm fine just the way I am. I live a good life, and those people live terrible lives. Well, I'll agree with them on the fact that those people live terrible lives. I may even agree that he lives a pretty good life but he's going to hell. That's not the issue. The unbelievers get caught up in the same problem believers do. They get their eyes on people. And people aren't the issue. Christ is the issue. And after you're saved, Christ is still the issue to eventually become occupied with Christ, to live the same spiritual life Christ lived. So it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. In Galatians 5.1 Stand firm then. Sometimes I'm dogmatic, you know that. Sometimes I'm dogmatic face to face with some people and it shocks them because usually I would never do such a thing as to be so dogmatic and raise my voice. But right here it says, Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So when that man came up to me and told me not to do something that I enjoyed doing and is part of my freedom, I stood firm! And I would not let myself be burdened by some guilt complex, which is a yoke of slavery. That's how the weak try to control the strong, is through guilt manipulation. I see parents do it all the time with their children because it seems to be the easiest way to get them in line, guilt them into line. 
well, they're going to have all kind of hang-ups and hang-ups in life just because you were lazy or because you didn't want to spank because you didn't want to see the see them cry or or whatever or you just had no idea how how to discipline your own children it's foreign to me i don't even uh i have a son he's going to be 4 september well, very soon. I know the date. I'm just not going to say it. But uh, he's going to be four. And, well, I love him to death. And I can't even imagine guilting him. Oh, he does wrong. Sure. And uh, I've had to use punishment. And I hated it more than he did. And he hated it, but I guarantee you that we were both in the bed crying together. <laughs> and then he did what old sin natures do. He turned to me and said, Daddy, why were you so mean to me? And I said, I wasn't being mean to you. You did wrong. So you were punished. And then all over again. But he had to understand that. I haven't had many problems since then. You have some, some of the kid who's that sensitive, especially sensitive toward his daddy. He's, uh, he, you know, he'll probably need it again sometime. But it sure did straighten him out for the most part. Now, people would say, I spoil my child, I give him this and that, and I do all sorts of things, and uh, that I should, or they say that I shouldn't do it. Hey, leave my freedom alone. It's my child. And since so-and-so probably doesn't listen to me on here. I don't know if she does or not, but if she does, so what? I give him Coke in the morning. Coca-Cola, not cocaine. <laughs> he runs around like he's on cocaine, but he likes Coca-Cola. I give him Coca-Cola then. Why not? It's got sugar in it. Sugar's good for you, by the way. And he's smart. Because he does, when he's over here, he does not want to go to sleep at all. And he figured out something. He started getting tired. He, I'd say, are you tired? Yes. Well, why don't we go to bed? Because I was surely tired by that time, midnight or so. He says, no, I'll just get a Coke. <laughs> he already had figured out he was getting a boost from the sugar and the caffeine. So you say, you're developing a drug addict. And I say, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, this country has lost its mind. Why, if you go back and look at the commercials of the 1950s, well then you recognize a country of freedom you know, they advertised Coke and said, you're never too young to start drinking Coke. And that was the advertisement. And before that, they actually did put a little cocaine in the Coke. Uh, but they didn't know much about cocaine when it first came out. Uh, but they, they knew that uh, they would get a lot of people hooked on this Coca-Cola product. And uh, my grandparent, my grandparents on my mother's side, I called them Nanny and Papa, they never went anywhere. They were a Mill Hill people and they lived in one spot in their Mill Hill village and to go to the grocery store is a grand event and to uh, go up the road to Chesney, which is 10 minutes away, that's a grand trip. To go to Greenville, well that's a freaking vacation. Well, they hopped in their car, 
drove all the way to Greenville, and back in those days, who knows how long that took, maybe an hour or longer. They didn't care. You know why? They wanted to buy some Coca-Cola. <laughs> Not to get off track, but the thing is, don't guilt your children. That's the worst thing you could do to them. You can tell them what's right and wrong. That's not guilting them. And you tell them if they do this thing that's wrong again, you will spank them. You can warn them, of course. And if they continue to do it, then the spanking begins. And then the, for a kid that's not hard-headed, the bad behavior ends. I don't believe in a timeout chair. I think that's the stupidest thing in the world. A timeout chair. Yeah, sometimes I think I'm, I'm realizing I'm getting old. I'm 36, but I feel like I'm really old. Not just health wise, but I mean, I feel like I'm old because when I went to school, I had a principal who had holes in his uh, big paddle and every day I would hear him paddling some bad kid and I would hear the screams down the hall and it wasn't no pow pow you heard pow And they deserved it. Boy, did they deserve it. Most of the time, he was very fair. But I'm sure he had some problems with some of them parents, but uh, that school was in a neighborhood where the parents didn't care. They needed some discipline. That's probably the first place they ever received some discipline. I remember one time the principal just happened to be walking by in the cafeteria. He just happened to be walking by and the, a student was talking, goofing off. And it was about time that we should uh, go get out from lunch and he hadn't eaten anything and the teacher said, uh, well, hurry up and eat your meal. We've got to go. And he smarted off. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember even at that age, you don't talk to adults that way. And he had long hair. And that principal hurt him, grabbed him by his long hair, and pulled him up out of the chair, bent him over right there in front of everybody, whipped out that paddle, and pow, 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 and wah! The boy ate his food. Eh, that stuff doesn't happen anymore, and that's part of our national decline. You say, that sounds abusive. No, it's not. Kids have to learn enforced humility because that little spanking is nothing compared to real life when you grow up. And if you're not adjusted to authority when you're young and a kid, and especially a teenager, you're going to be a kid the rest of your life. You'll never adjust to life. You're going to be totally messed up. And uh, you'll be acting like a teenager when you're 60 years old. If you make it there, most of those types die off early. In Ephesians 3.12 it says, In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Since we are a royal priesthood and we represent ourselves before God, we can approach God with freedom in prayer and confidence. Have you ever been confident toward God? So I don't know kind of scary 
Not really. Because you have his righteousness. <laughs> he loves you with a perfect love. Now, if you get a little out of line and disrespectful, he'll spank you. But this confidence has to do with the fact that uh, you're approaching him with the confidence because you have a knowledge of Bible doctrine. And as a result, you can go straight to God in prayer. I've done it myself. Gone, I've gone to God in prayer and started preaching to him. His own word. Why? Well, I was having some issues. So I said, God, you know that all things work together for good for those who love you. You know I love you, etc. That's approaching God with freedom and confidence. I've seen how others try to approach God in the holiness movements and elsewhere. When I was younger, because uh, a lot of my relatives are into those Wesleyan type, uh, pilgrim holiness type, church of God type things, I would uh, spend some summers with them. I'd get to go to upstate New York or I got to ride with my Uncle Pink who was a very funny man and he had the gift of evangelism I just wish he knew how to evangelize and I'm sure the people were saved who listened to him and they might have gave just out uh, just enough so that God the Holy Spirit made that available to them but if he had had some doctrine he would have been an excellent evangelist but anyway he was quite a character but he still went to these churches and I remember going to one and when they started praying first of all you all you have to get on your knees <clears throat> so he would get on our knees I remember my cousin and I were the same age and we practically grew up together and there were these two teenage girls our age and they had to bend over in front of us and we had to bend over and so we were laughing, having a good time checking out the girls. <laughs> Bad preacher, huh? I'm normal. I'm a normal man. <laughs> and I, well, <laughs> except that I know Bible doctrine. That makes me very abnormal. But they start off, ooh, and it gets louder because then they start getting into competition. Next thing I know, it's just, I just start laughing because it sounds so ridiculous. And I started laughing one time when I was with my uncle. We called him Pink. And when I was with my uncle Pink at this little preacher man who was running up and down the aisle and shouting and stomping and I couldn't even understand what he was saying. And, uh, and I had a southern accent back then. Still couldn't understand what he was saying because he was just screaming. And I was just laughing louder and I couldn't hold it in. They probably thought I got the second blessing. I got the ghost. Oh, well. It was a good experience, he said. It was a good experience to see these things because now I know how to explain it. <laughs> if I had never seen those things... I probably would have thought the rest of Christianity was just like uh, the way I grew up. I had a friend once, and name's Gary. He uh, told me that he grew up listening to Bible doctrine like I did. His parents listened to Bible doctrine. And so he thought, well, every church is pro just like the Bracket Church. Which he had never been to any other church. So he thought he'd just walk in and hear some doctrine. He found out how kooky and flaky it was. And, and it's because he didn't have a frame of reference for when the colonel would say, those legalists, the colonel had a frame of reference for it, plus it's in the Bible, 
But when you're a teenager and you're not around it, you don't have a frame of reference. For, well, I haven't even been around anybody like what who, who he's talking about. Well, I've been around it, and I can tell you it's not freedom. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's slavery. They all want you to dress the same. They all want you to act the same. They all want the women to wear their hair the same way. They all want their women not to wear makeup. They want their women to be as ugly as ugly as possible, both inside and out. And they achieve it. And it's all human uniformity. Well, you'd think you'd just walked into communist Russia, where everything is the same. You say, oh, Russia's not communist anymore. Well, have fun. Go over there. <laughs> You'll learn something quite different. Now it's just cor more corrupt is all. They're still drunk. I don't think that'll ever change in their history. Anyway... In him and through faith, we, we can approach God with confidence. And then Colossians 2.16. Colossians 2.16 references freedom from human rules. That's Colossians 2.16. Therefore do not. This is emphatic. This is from the Word of God. It's telling you not to compromise, and I'll tell you in a minute, you'll know what it's telling you not to compromise on. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you. I like that. Why? Because it's the Word of God. And don't let them judge you how and in by what manners. Don't let them judge you by what you eat or drink. There's a lot of people on, a lot of Christians on a health food nut type deal and they're always trying to tell somebody how to eat. You know that's wrong. Now you, it's okay to tell them about your diet and you say, well this is what I'm doing and it seems to be helping me and I really like to uh, eat a banana because it makes me feel better, or I'm drinking this certain juice because it has uh, these antioxidants in it, and I have a bad heart, so therefore uh, it helps me feel better and re reduces the angina, angina attacks I have, etc. And uh, th that's fine. I'm not talking about just a normal conversation. But uh, let anybody get ill, and the first thing they're going to do is say, you need to eat something different. Well, it may be true, but that's for what doctors need to figure that out. Not the hoi polloi. You see, when you go to a doctor, you're giving them the freedom to check you out. Now, it's not, of course they have good intentions, but good intentions lead straight to hell. I'm not impressed with good intentions. I'm impressed with the Word of God. And it says, Don't let them judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival. And what that means is with regard to holidays. A new moon celebration or a Sabbath day remember when I lived down south people would cease from mowing their lawn on Sunday but right here it's telling us we're free from that we can't be judged by that our Sabbath, as it says in Hebrews, we've changed dispensations now. We're no longer under the uh, rules of Israel. If we were, then take all the bacon and sausage out of your refrigerator. Take a lot out of your refrigerator, actually. Because they were prohibited. 
And if we were, I would have a lamb in my backyard ready for sacrifice tonight to burn in the fire pit. <laughs> but you see, they don't follow the whole thing. Just, just little bits and pieces, that's all. Mainly the Ten Commandments plus a, a few of their own ideas. But what Paul is saying here is, you know what? Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Some people like to have a little wine. And to some people, that means you're, in, you're going to hell, believe it or not. Sounds goofy, but, but that's what Paul's referring to. By what you eat or drink. Our Lord made a perfect point about this. He said, you know, he really caught him. He always caught him. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. But the legalists came up to him, and they were uh, asking, trying to trap him. Well, he just turned it right around and trapped them because uh, they came up and they said, uh, you know, teacher, you, your disciples, they don't wash their hands before they eat. They don't do this or that or the other. They don't seem to follow our customs. Why is that? Well, Jesus simply looked at them and said, When John the Baptist came into the wilderness, he neither ate nor drank. In other words, he didn't eat anything that would be uh, considered unclean because all he ate were locust and honey. And uh, he didn't drink, which means he didn't drink alcohol because they were accusing the Lord and his disciples for being alcoholics. And he said... Uh, John the Baptist came preaching what I preach, and he neither ate nor drank, yet you did not believe him. Now the Son of Man comes, both eating and drinking, and you do not believe him. So he trapped him. He's saying, you people can't be satisfied. And a type of person who wants to stick their nose into everybody's business is not satisfied by anything. They did not like John the baptizer. Why? Because he taught Bible doctrine. Had nothing to do with what he ate or drank. So he didn't do anything at all by which they could criticize him. That was on purpose. Then the Lord came into the world. And he did everything by which they could criticize him. And that was on purpose. Except he was without sin. He was free from human regulation though. So Paul picks up on it. We're not under the Sabbath. And why did I scream Sabbath day? We're not under the Sabbath. You can't be judged by a Sabbath day. And I follow the Sabbath every day. Unless I'm at a fellowship for a day. Who knows? But uh, when I'm in fellowship and inside the divine dinosphere I'm having a Sabbath I'm resting in the Lord that's what it means today and I'll do whatever I want on Sunday those hypocrites they won't do a thing on Sunday and talk about it they won't even buy gas but they sure will run to the restaurant and make somebody else work on the Sabbath 
right after church. Probably don't even leave a tip. Cruel. That's what religion is. And when you are a believer in legalist, you've just reverted back to your old self as a religious person, if you were one. And if you were not, then you acted better as an unbeliever. You're just saved now. That's the only difference. I've met people like that. And I've told them, you acted better. You were much more fun to be around before you got saved. They didn't understand what I was talking about. It has to do with the judgmentalism and the fact that believers think the spiritual life is here for them to take away not only their own freedom but everyone else's and that Christians even though we're all different and we're all individuals and we all live our own individual spiritual life and uh, we are they try to make us believe that we're all supposed to walk around in, ta in tandem like a Nazi soldiers with one foot in front of the other, and when we have to say Heil, we say Heil, and everybody does it in unison, and we all are just one mass of following man-made rules. You just fell right back into religion. You're saved, but you're going to be punished. You're not even going to know why, because as I told you last night, covered in dung but you can't smell yourself you can smell others because they're clean they're not as stinky as you probably well last night we dis discussed uh, Saul of Tarsus how he was the worst of all sinners the reason he was religious. And religion is the devil's ace trump. And he was the most religious man in all of human history. And there will never be a more religious man than Saul of Tarsus. There never was. There never will be. And you say, isn't that good? No, that's terrible. The Pope doesn't even get close to being as religious as Saul of Tarsus. The Dalai Lama doesn't even get close to being as religious as Saul of Tarsus. Buddha doesn't even get close. But All these religious figures, they can't save and the law couldn't save, and Saul of Tarsus was running around judging people. Oh, he got a fat head. Pride, you see. He thought he was something else. He was giving advice to everyone because he had a genius mind and he could recall like a computer with exact detail each and every law of the Torah. And they not, didn't only have a Torah, which he memorized. The, that's the Old Testament. They also had another book, which normally I would be able to remember. But it was a book written by Jews for Jews. It's not biblical. But uh, some of the Jews follow it today, and the rabbis follow it today. Um, but it has about uh, a thousand different rules on one subject the Sabbath and it goes into the discussion of if I spit on the ground and make the dust move on the Sabbath am I in violation and they have a discussion so somebody would run up to Saul of Tarsus I wasn't even thinking <laughs> and you know what I spit on the ground and I saw the dust fly. Am I in violation? What should I do? Isn't that ridiculous? 
Well, those are the worst of all sinners, obviously. Why? First of all, pride in themselves, and they are taking away people's freedom and making them slaves to a bunch of man-made rules. And they're violating people's privacy. And when the Christians came around and they were demonstrating their freedom, that made Paul so angry he became a murderer. And he was out to even go outside of his country to murder Christians because they weren't following the law. And that's when the Lord gave him a big knock on the head and blinded him. He said, why persecute you me, Paul or Saul? And he said, is that you, Lord? So he was personally witnessed to by Jesus Christ. All apostles, by the way, had to see Jesus Christ. That was a requirement. And uh, Paul was an unbeliever. You say, well, why did it happen to Paul? Not everybody else. Well, Paul was an unbeliever, but he was called to be an apostle. And in order to be an apostle, you had to see Jesus Christ. So he got to see him. And that is how he was saved. That's an amazing topic in itself. <clears throat> but uh, what we'll get to tomorrow is the fact that, well, we're going to start talking about uh, the worst sins, why they are the worst of the sins. Um, I'll talk about the other sins that aren't listed as the worst and why why are they sin even or because I get that question from the antinomian group well why can't I just do this and that if it feel good why can't I do it well because of freedom what do you mean you'll destroy your freedom you're being self-indulgent and selfish and if you have children and you're running around on each other, you're affecting your children's lives. You're not an island to yourself. Who do you think you are? You have responsibilities. And God set up these rules for a reason, and they were for your benefit, not to keep you from having fun, but to allow you to have fun and freedom. Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.